Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Over the past few years, things have been developing quickly with regards to Turkish archaeology and one project really stands out, Tashtapela, which, as you probably know by now, is an upland area in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey, near the city of Şanlıurfa. Translated to English, Tashtapela means stone hills and it consists of a number of pre-pottery Neolithic sites including Karahan Tepe, Sefer Tepe, Harbetsevan Tepesi and of course the famous UNESCO World Heritage Site of Gebekli Tepe. In this video I'll be showing you the latest official update on the site. All the new finds and all the news from the latest excavations presented by Dr. Lee Clare of the German Archaeological Institute. Dr. Clare recently took part in a four and a half hour presentation on the Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel. Apologies if I've said that wrong. In this presentation, a number of archaeologists discuss the latest findings and recent work at seven of the twelve Tashtapela sites. Archaeology Harbour was founded in 2009 by a team of dedicated archaeologists who wish to convey the latest archaeological news from Turkey in a socially responsible way. An important project, especially because of the growing number of claims, many unfounded or based on outdated information about the country's pre-pottery Neolithic past. They do have a very active YouTube channel with a live show every Friday, an active Twitter feed and also a Facebook page, all of which I've linked below and I would urge everyone with an interest to subscribe and follow. Of course the content is generally in Turkish, but you can of course auto-translate videos in the settings on YouTube and so you can keep up to date with the latest developments directly from the archaeologists. As stated, as part of this four and a half hour Tashtapela update, Dr. Lee Clare presented the latest findings from Gebekli Tepe, and he did this in English, which I know is the first language for most of my subscribers. The good people at Archaeology Harbour have granted me permission to publish Dr. Clare's presentation on the Ancient Architects channel. And so now, without further ado, here is the latest update from this enigmatic ancient site, first presented on YouTube on November the 4th, 2022. Please do subscribe, thank you for watching and enjoy. Okay, I'd like to give you a brief rundown of the work currently underway at Gebekli Tepe and uh, actually the work taking place or that took place this year on our excavations. Um, we've heard a great deal already from Nejmi about the background of the site and of course one of the things that we've always been saying or saying for a long time is that Gebekli Tepe is not the single site, it's not the, you know, the, the smoking gun of Neolithization. There are many more sites, it's part of a larger network. But of course a lot of the attention in the past years has been on Gebekli Tepe, especially with the UNESCO uh, application and inscription in 2018 of course we have a lot of attention coming to Gebekli Tepe um, but of course with the new results and the new excavations taking place within the frame of the Tash Tepele project of course we are now for the first time having good comparative data to compare the data from Gebekli Tepe from the last 25 years or so so this is something that we're very happy about and um, you know it's going to improve our understanding of the Neolithic in the Shan Urfa region um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to um, you know, the, the chance to speak today and also to obviously work at the site. Um, the German Archaeological Institute has been at the site for a very long time, since the very beginning, in fact, um, with Harald Hauptmann and then, uh, of course, with Klaus Schmidt. And of course, when he passed away in 2014, then, of course, we had a very strong cooperation with the museum. And in the last years, also, of course, with the Istanbul University and with Nejmi Karol. So our work is continuing at the site and it's funded by the German Research Foundation over the past 12 years by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. So thank you um, also at that, this point to them for this funding. Um, 
so you can see obviously a few pictures, a couple of pictures here on the left hand side, the site with the new shelter as we know it. And of course, on the right, an impression of the work taking place this year at the site. Now, uh, this season, we were in the field for a total of 70 days. Um, we were doing a, a great deal of work because, of course, in the past two years, because of the pandemic, um, we were restricted and limited to what we could do in the field. Um, so the thing is, of course, we had um, work that had been sort of uh, waiting. 2020, we couldn't go to the field because of the, the pandemic. 2021, it was cut short because of the uh, COVID. And of course, we had a lot of stuff to catch up with. A lot of the uh, experts that wanted to come had to come. And there was also a backlog of material to process. Now, one of the good things about um, the, the, the more recent work at the site is the fact that we're looking more closely at the botanical remains. Because of course, for a long time, it was thought that the botanics were not well preserved. But in the past years or so, we've been doing a lot of um, wet sieving. And you can see here uh, on this left-hand photo, the, the flotation machine that we now have, have in operation. So actually flotating um, a lot of the material, the excavated sediments from the excavations, and we're having a lot of samples come out. So we're hoping on some very new results from that area, the botanics, in the next um, uh, years um, when, when that's been started. Um, so you have to imagine, of course, that we are now a UNESCO site so we have a lot of things to think about, okay? We can't just go in there and excavate. We have to make sure that everything, and this is, applies to all sites, but especially for Gobekli Tepe, that we have this very strong uh, link between conservation, presentation, and our academic questions, because of course, this is very important that all three uh, play a role in our work. Um, what we were doing this year in the field, we were doing, of course, some minor excavations and some trench cleaning. We we're doing sieving and flotation, as I mentioned, fine processing, fine recording and building archaeology. So a great deal of things were going on. We had uh, a good team uh, with us this year, which included, um, uh, of course, members from the, from the German Archaeological Institute, both from the Istanbul and Orient departments, students from the Haran University and from other universities as well. Uh, a small number of other specialists, and of course, the workmen from Erlangic Village, who we shouldn't forget here at this point. Now, as I said, we like to combine our work at the site, preservation, conservation, and our academic questions. And you may be aware, or those of you that have visited the site in recent years, that the northern part of the site, north of the special buildings, you can see the blue areas here on the map, they have been somewhat left um, uh, for a while and haven't been properly cared for. And we have a very deep or very uh, high profile or high section in this area, um, which has been subject to modern erosion. And this needed to be uh, preserved, presented um, and, and conserved. And this has been the area we've, we've been working in for the past couple of years. So you can see the state of, of this area in 2021, before field work started, so last year. And then at the end of last year, we had went down, we cleared this area, and we found numerous domestic buildings in this area. Um, I think, you know, this is also an important insight from the past years, is that we're now moving away, obviously, from the previous interpretation of the site as a purely ritual or a purely cult site to one of a settlement with special buildings. And I've spoken about that on, on various occasions. Um, and of course, this was a state at the end of 2021. And of course, this work also helped to remove any danger of further erosion of, uh, of, of the, the profile, the section slipping down into the main excavation area where the special buildings are, the building D, the, the so-called temples where they are. So this is very important. This year we did the documentation um, of these buildings that we discovered in 2021 using SFM, so Structure for Motion Documentation. You can see here 
these wonderful rectangular buildings. I mean, these are uh, most likely or certainly uh, of PPNB or early PPNB date. So we're looking at 8,700. So the first half of the ninth millennium to the middle of the ninth millennium BC, you can see this conglomeration, conglomeration of, of rooms that have been um, sort of built onto one another. Um, and this also on a slope. So we're looking at slope architecture, which is a very uh, important feature of um, of the site. And these excavations continued this year. And as I said, the domestic sort of features of this site are now becoming more and more apparent. Um, so in previous years, in the course of the preparation for the construction of the new permanent shelters um, at Gobekli Tepe, there were deep soundings, which actually led us to discover in the very lowermost levels, domestic architecture houses um, were at the site from actually the very beginning of the settlement um, or the occupation of Gebekli Tepe. And here we have one of these buildings on the, I just showed you um, following further excavation. And you can see here, um, of course, an in situ um, vessel, limestone vessel. We have here uh, sort of a bench coming in. And the most impressive thing is that these walls, the buildings, are preserved in places up to two and a half meters in height. So this is a very well-preserved architecture. And as we're now seeing more sort of evidence for domestic activity with the uh, basalt uh, grinding stones actually coming out in the surface, um, the floor surface, the plaster floor, um, and also uh, what we think is also in roof collapse. So we're now thinking that the buildings, obviously these, these PPNB buildings were houses with activities going on on the roof or on a first floor um, where people were actually undertaking these activities. So very good domestic uh, signal. And of course the lithics, the, the, the flint tools that we're discovering are also telling us, yes, this, these assemblages are very typical of domestic sites. So um, this is really the focus of our work at present, to actually understand the domestic um, occupation. Of, we, we, we're, of course, still looking at the, the ritual functions and the, and the big special buildings, but it's really nice that in the past few years, we've been able to concentrate on the areas that were less, uh, were given less attention in, in previous years. So this domestic side of things. And uh, you can see here um, this same building, um, as a structure for motion. So it's all being documented um, with state-of-the-art equipment, structure for motion, it's being measured, GPS, it's being you know scanned, it's being uh, really um, well documented. And uh, one of the special features of one of the buildings here, you just saw it in the previous uh, slide here, uh, in the corner of, of the building next to the bench um, and here as well. But here is a close up. What we have here is um, a feature uh, in the plaza floor, which appears to actually be some sort of hearth or fire um, uh, place. Um, and of course, this was the evidence that Klaus Schmidt was missing when he was excavating at the site. He never or said he never really found evidence for the domestic or ovens, this sort of thing going on at Gobekli Tepe, but we have this evidence coming in now, and this year was a very good year uh, where we found this feature in space 61. Um, we have also more or less uh, been able to identify sort of a type of structure, a type of PPNB building. So again, we're talking about the mid ninth millennium uh, BC, so the first half of the ninth millennium BC. You can see that they're characteristically sort of trapezoid or rectangular in shape. Sometimes they have a niche built into one of the corners. They have a bench. They have sometimes a T-pillar, although the ones excavated in the past couple of years above in the northern part of the site are not showing or not, they don't have T-pillars. So it could well be we have different functions of different buildings going on. Um, and it would appear that these buildings could be in fact contemporaneous, the same age. So by the, this time, by the, the first half of the millennium BC, we're looking at a quite compact and a very sort of um, uh, a busy, flourishing uh, settlement, in fact. And especially if you remember that this main excavation area is only one part of a much larger site. 
Um, and of course, this building tide is also appearing at other sites, um, at Harvard Suan, for example. Uh, I've got a picture here from uh, Bahatin Celix excavations. Uh, similar type, uh, you can uh, see it there. And of course, the new buildings coming up, uh, and we'll see these in, in more detail later, I think, uh, at Cyborg, for example, on a, on a visit last year or the year before, and here at Sefetepe. For example, I mean, when I went to these sites, and you know, if I were to shut my eyes and open them, um, you know, I would think I were I was in Gebekli Tepe. The, 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 the comparisons, at first glance at least, um, the impression that I have, it's so, you know, homogeneous, it's, it's, it's actually quite astounding. Um, anyway, as I was saying, we also uh, are doing some work, or the work we're doing is a mixture of conservation, presentation, and excavation. And of course, there are a lot of these, these bulks between the different trenches that are still actually haven't been excavated, and these make for quite ugly sort of uh, uh, like a disturbance in, in the picture of the site. So we are now actually excavating or removing these old sort of um, uh, bulks, um, these, these, uh, I don't know, these, these um, what do you call them, uh, sort of tracks that were used previously for the wheelbarrows, um, uh, for the Elavas, and we're actually moving, uh, we're excavating those, and they've actually led to new discoveries, in fact. Um, here, in this particular bulk, um, stratigraphically above the early PPMB buildings, we have a later structure. Now, this appears to be, we don't actually know exactly how old this structure is, but it's certainly younger than early PPNB, it could be middle PPNB or perhaps even late PPNB. Um, but you can see here, they're returned to this sort of round shape with a plaster floor and these upright limestone slabs. I mean, this example here would have been, you know, a couple of meters in diameter. So very interesting structures. And we have evidence for the remains of these spotted or dotted around uh, the site at Gebekli Tepe. So um, it's, we're actually increasing our, our um, sort of the, the the time span that we knew Gebekli Tepe was in use. We're still waiting for some radiocarbon data from, from these structures, um, but we have sort of ideas from the lithic assemblages that there are some elements within that that could actually be later than early PPMB, perhaps middle PPMB, even pushing into late PPMB. So it's a very interesting thing that's fitting in with the lithics that we have at the moment. So we're very happy uh, you know, that this work, in fact, that's so important for the presentation of the site, for the site management, um, and it's just delivering also these academic insights that's so important for our understanding of the history of the site. Of course, you know, the field work um, uh, is not always easy, especially with all the visitors around, and sometimes we have to excavate beneath the shelter, which is also quite cramped, but it's all going uh, very well. What I wanted to also point out, you know, mentioning the domestic, uh, you know, not just the houses, quite characteristic or important for domestic activity is, of course, the remains or human remains, uh, burials. And you may, um, oh, just before we go there, this is building G, which we also, um, you can see it on, here on the left-hand side, just above the arrow, building G is also um, a ritual building, a communal building, uh, very comparable probably to the um, cult building found at Navalichori from the type. Um, this is partially excavated and we did some cleaning work here and actually extended uh, the trench backwards and into the bulk and actually found the southern wall of this building this year. Now going to the burials because of course this is very important for the domestic sort of uh, interpretation of the site, because as you probably know, most of you, you know, that it was quite characteristic for the people to actually bury their dead uh, beneath uh, the floors of the houses or close to the domestic um, structures, to their dwellings. Um, this burial actually uh, was discovered uh, in 2017 when we were excavating for the construction of the GT1 or the new sort of shelter over the main excavation area. You can see here the, the, the kidney-shaped pit with the remains of three individuals uh, disturbed in the prehistoric past, but the three individuals were still there. In this burial, we had uh, three individuals, I'd say one female or two females, one male or female, I wasn't quite sure, 
uh, of 11 to 14, 35 and 20 to 30 years of age. And as I say, the, the bones have been sort of disturbed and placed to the side of the pit. There were no grave offerings, uh, only a, a couple of, of large lithic or flint blades. Some of the bones were also found still in, uh, in their uh, in anatomical um, uh, position. This year, we returned to a burial that actually was discovered by Klaus Schmidt uh, back in 2012, but was not excavated at the time. This is also a, a subfloor burial located to the west of Building A. Um, at the time, I say it wasn't uh, excavated. It was it was covered and left. And because we had our anthropology expert at the site this year, we thought it'd be a good idea to actually recover this burial, which we did. And you can see here the remains Oh, this is a, actually pictures from 2012, and we have then the, the burial uh, recorded and excavated this year. It's of one individual, 13 to 14 years of age, uh, north, west, west, south, east oriented, the head in the northwest, probably subfloor, but the floor was very poorly preserved in this building, and the individual had been buried in hocker position. So it's um, another good indication that we're dealing with a domestic site and not purely a ritual site, I think. Um, we also did some excavations in uh, Building D, so the, the best preserved, you could say, of the special buildings at the site. Um, previously, um, we had removed the, uh, the, 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 the sediment that had been left by Klaus Schmidt between the two central pillars. Um, um, and then this year, and after that work, new features were actually discovered in the floor of the building. And now you can see here on the right hand side, another structure for motion. You can see the, the pedestal of the pedest where the um, central pillar or the left hand westernmost central pillar of this building was uh, would extend. It's not actually in this uh, diagram. And just in front of it, there's a small pit, um, which we thought could in fact be a further burial, uh, it being a ritual building, a communal building. And this we wanted to check, which we did. Um, you can see it here from the vertical. We excavated this, we removed the slab, and actually we didn't find any burial at all. Um, but in fact, it appears what was happening here, the people were actually repairing the, the, the plateau in this position to make it very smooth and repair the floor of the building um, to make it, uh, you know, less unattractive or more attractive. Um, so this was an important insight that we had from this year's uh, excavations. And as I said, we did some trench cleaning also in the northwestern part of the site to make uh, the site more presentable to the public. And here you can see um, the before and after in that area. Um, now, of course, with Gobekli Tepe, the, the site has been under excavation for a very long time. You know, I say very long time over two decades, two and a half decades. So we have a lot of old data um, from the site. You know, in the course of time, technologies improve. It's also important for us to keep up to date with the state of the art methodologies at the DAI. And as part of that, we've been checking all of the previous plans, all of the, the previous findings, um, and using GPS um, and various other systems, GIS, to actually um, check and all the old plans now have been digitized, uh, digitalized, and also um, uh, with GIS, we, we now have geo-reference plans of the site um, for the first time, which will, of course, then be made accessible uh, to everyone. I mean, this is the whole idea to share the data at the end. Um, so this also in includes also the excavations, the old excavation trenches, and of course, a lot of the old finds that are now in the museum, uh, stored there. We've been doing a lot of recontextualization, which means to check where these finds were originally from um, and to compile a new database so that at the end of our project, we can say, you know, we have done our best to actually bring the, the past 25 years or 20 years of excavations up to date and to present it in a way that we all uh, can use it. So I don't want to uh, talk too long, so I'd just like to thank again uh, the people I mentioned at the beginning, and we look forward, of course, to all our future collaborations in the frame of the Tash Tepila project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.